Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to lesson two in our series of lessons describing the compromises that took place at the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia in 1787 that helped create the government of the United States we currently have and the Constitution that we currently live under. Today's lesson is going to answer the essential question, how was Article 1, the legislative branch, agreed to by the delegates to the Constitutional Convention? Remember, at the beginning of the convention, the delegates decided that they were going to create a government that had three branches, a legislative branch, an executive branch, and a judicial branch. And today's lesson will discuss how the legislative branch, also known as Article 1, the very first article in the Constitution, was written and created. So, our first left side question will then be, how was the legislative branch created? This is the first article of Constitution. This is why it's often referred to as the first branch of government, especially by people who actually serve in Congress. And it's basically going to um, help create what we now know as the Congress of the United States. Um, when the convention first began, there were two plans that were put forward for debate on how to construct uh, the legislative branch, although they did have some ideas about the executive as well. So, so let's delve into those plans. Plan number one is called the Virginia Plan. It's also known as the Big State Plan because it favored the interests of states that had large populations. So it was proposed by James Madison. James Madison was from Virginia. So um, he was from a state that was bigger and wanted to have more power. And uh, incidentally, he was also the fourth president of the United States during the War of 1812 when the White House was burned down. Um, as I stated already, the Virginia plan was a plan that favored big states. And if you're asking yourself, how did it favor big states? I'm going to answer that question. Uh, it favored big states by proposing a two-house legislature. Uh, here's a fancy new vocabulary word for you. When you are creating a legislature that has two houses, that is called a bicameral legislature. And he wanted each of those houses to be based on the population of each state. So he wanted there to be two houses, and he wanted both of those houses to be based on population. And again, the word bicameral also means two houses. Thus the word bi, which means two. It proposed a single powerful executive. So as you recall, under the Articles of Confederation, there was no single leader. Uh, Mr. Madison was proposing that they create a single powerful leader for the country that would be the chief executive and would be in charge of the executive branch of government. And the other deficiency of the Articles of Confederation is that there was no national court system, so the Virginia plan proposed by James Madison did propose to create that national court system. So all of these are parts of what we will call the big state plan. So I bet you're guessing if there's a big state plan, there must be a small state plan. And if you are guessing that, ladies and gentlemen, you are correct because the small state plan was also known as the New Jersey plan, which back in those days was a small state. Uh, these days, New Jersey would be considered a medium-sized state. But back in those days, it was a small state. Um, the New Jersey plan was proposed by a gentleman by the name of William Patterson. Uh, there is a place called Patterson, New Jersey, by the way. So they, they named a place in New Jersey after him. Um, and this was known as the small state plan. So it did favor small states. The difference between the Virginia plan and the New Jersey plan is that the New Jersey plan proposed a one house, also known as a unicameral legislature, that was based on equality between the states. So in this case, it was proposing to create a legislative body, a Congress that was very similar to the Congress under the Articles of Confederation, because the Congress under the Articles of Confederation 
made every state equal in terms of its representation. Every state had the same number of votes in the Articles of Confederation Congress. So under the New Jersey plan, that would be essentially the same. Uh, the New Jersey plan also uh, did not want there to be one leader. They did not trust one person to be the leader. They wanted to create a three executive council. So three people would have to get together and at least two out of the three of them would have to vote a certain direction uh, for things to happen. Um, they did not want one person to have all the power because they were afraid that one person could um, basically become uh, a tyrant and exercise too much power. So they proposed a three-person executive. And the one similarity between the two plans is that the New Jersey plan did also propose that there be a national court system. So these plans basically served as you know opening um, positions for the different sides that were at the Constitutional Convention. And to be honest with you, it took quite a bit of time for them to start thinking of alternatives or compromises uh, that would help them get to where they wanted to be in the end. Um, and before this lesson is over with, you're going to know what compromise they eventually came up with. Uh, this lovely slide is here to visually show you how the plans were different uh, in very nice bullet points. So on the left, you have the large state plan, the Virginia plan proposed by James Madison. Uh, the more people you have living in your state, the more members of this new Congress that they were creating you would be able to elect and therefore the more power you would be able to have in terms of writing the laws for the country. And they wanted to have two houses, both based on population, and they only wanted to have one executive, one person in charge. So this would have been a stronger government. Uh, the New Jersey plan did favor the small states. They only wanted one house. They wanted that house to be based on equality between the states. And they wanted to have three people in charge, not one, because they did not trust one person to be in charge. So if you're making an argument here, the Virginia plan was probably setting up a government that was somewhat more powerful than the New Jersey plan. Um, so you may now be asking yourself, how did they finally resolve this conflict between the two plans? How did they resolve the conflict between the large states and the small states? And I am about to give you the answer. The answer is called the Great Compromise. So here we are discussing how this um, compromise was achieved by essentially taking some parts of the Virginia plan and some parts of the New Jersey plan, putting them together and creating what became the roadmap for basically the entire Constitution. This is kind of important, which is why it is called the Great Compromise. First of all, there was a gentleman by the name of Roger Sherman. He was from Connecticut. Connecticut was neither a large nor a small state. It was a medium-sized state, so it made sense that this proposal came from a medium-sized state. He suggested a compromise that made both the small and the large states happy. Basically, both sides got something they wanted, as you are about to discover. Uh, they decided to create a Congress of the United States, and it would be bicameral. In other words, it would have two houses. So from that perspective, the Virginia plan won out because the Virginia plan wanted two houses, and the New Jersey plan only wanted one house. And so since they agreed to make it bicameral, in this case, winner to the Virginia plan. Here's where it gets interesting. Um, they agreed that one of the houses, which they were going to call the House of Representatives, would be based on a state's population. In other words, states that have more people living in it, more citizens, would get more representatives in the House of Representatives, which is half of the Congress. The Senate, which they were also creating, would be based on equality between the states. And in the Senate, every state would get two senators. So the Senate would be similar to the Articles of Confederation Congress, where every state had the same amount of votes. The House of Representatives would be closer to what was put forward in the Virginia plan. 
it would be bicameral but basically if you were a virginia plan supporter you really liked this house of representatives if you were a new new jersey plan supporter you really liked this senate and between the two enough people were willing to support this compromise that work on the constitution was able to continue and this is where the basic roadmap for what we now call congress came from because when we talk about congress we're talking about the house and the senate and when you look at a lovely picture of the capitol building in washington dc there are two wings to that building one of them is the senate the other one is the house here's the part that gets uncomfortable but we must discuss it on um, the issue of slavery because the house of representatives was going to be based on a state's population um, the slaves in those states had to be either counted or not counted as part of that state's population to determine how many votes that state would get in the house of representatives and this was an issue of considerable struggle between the delegates because the northern states did not want slaves to count towards the state's populations and the southern states insisted upon it and so they had to compromise if they didn't compromise the constitution never would have been approved if the constitution was never approved we might have split into multiple countries at that point in time and so this compromise is what made it possible for the constitution to be approved even though it is incredibly awkward to discuss and uh, it's just it's ugly let's just be honest about it this is ugly um, it was decided that slaves were going to count as three-fifths of a person and I put that in quotes in terms of southern states population in the house or for purposes of taxation so you could look at this two ways they were going to count three out of every five slaves towards the state's population or they were going to count every slave as three-fifths of a person and I'm not going to sit here and pretend that calling anyone three-fifths of a person is acceptable but this is the year 1787 we're talking about not the year 2019 or whatever year you happen to be watching this lesson in so it is what it is and this was the case until 1865 when uh, the Civil War ended and the Constitution was revised to get rid of some of these racist things uh, that were in the Constitution so uh, that sad face is there for a reason uh, on the upcoming slides I am going to show you in detail how the House and how the Senate operate uh, but for now we're gonna leave it here all right ladies and gentlemen now we're going to go ahead and look at the house of representatives how it works and how it is set up and so i'm actually going to talk you through this um, on some websites um, first of all uh, we're going to talk about the modern era there are 435 members of the house of representatives if you're talking about the representatives that are elected from the 50 states uh, if you're talking about the territories and places like Puerto Rico they get delegates to Congress but they are not actually permitted to vote on laws so right here on this website I'm going to actually look at the representatives that are in the house and this lists them alphabetically um, we're going to go by state so you can see Alabama gets seven Alaska only gets one Arizona gets nine let's pay attention to California here California gets because of its 39 million people we're still scrolling through California California gets 53 53 representatives uh, let's scroll down to Oregon because that's where we happen to live how many do you think Oregon gets any guesses any guesses any guesses well I have an answer for you Oregon gets wait for it wait for it there we are Oregon gets five representatives in Congress um, there are their names and there are their political parties uh, and more on that later uh, the other state that gets quite a few there's Florida there's also Texas Texas because of its size and population gets 
36 members of Congress. Utah gets four. So if you could add all these up, they turn out to be 435. Um, and they're almost all Democrats and Republicans. Currently, there is one independent who um, resigned from the Republican Party and became an independent. Um, you can ask me about that. So let's look at the different states, starting with our own state. This is a map of Oregon showing you the five congressional districts in Oregon. Uh, and you'll notice they're different sizes, but what you need to understand that is within the borders of each of these districts is the same number of people, approximately, based on the census. Every 10 years, we're required to take a census, uh, counting up how many people live here, and then the state gets divvied up and divided into congressional districts, and each district is supposed to represent the same number of people. So, uh, District 3 has most of urban Portland in it, which is why it is much smaller, whereas District 2 has over two-thirds of the state, and the population is roughly equivalent between all this space and this small space. Um, we are here in Salem and Kaiser. We're in the 5th Congressional District and it takes in Tillamook and Lincoln counties on the coast. And then south of us, uh, the whole Eugene area, everything south to the California border is in the 4th Congressional District. So let's go ahead and look at the people who represent us here in Oregon. Um, Suzanne Bonamici represents that Northwest District. Greg Walden represents the big area of two thirds. He is retiring uh, at the end of his current term, um, but he's the only Republican elected federally in the state of Oregon. And then there's Earl Blumenauer, who represents Portland, Peter DeFazio, who represents the area from Eugene South, and our representative here is Kurt Schrader. More on that in just a moment. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at California. California has 53 members of the House of Representatives based on its population. So first of all, you see um, the map of California as a whole. Um, look at the northern part of the state, this very large district and this very large district. Basically, this is a part of California where not many people live. And then you get into the San Francisco Bay Area. There's quite a few congressional districts there. In the Los Angeles area alone, look at all the congressional districts that the Los Angeles area alone gets. So basically, if you took five of these districts here, you would have roughly the same population as the entire state of Oregon. Uh, so that tells you a little bit about the difference between um, Oregon and California. And let's go ahead and look at California's representatives. You might want to pay attention to how many Democrats versus how many Republicans there are because it will tell you something about California. So that very northern large area in California is a Republican district, but let's just uh, scroll down and uh, see how much blue there is versus how much uh, red. And you can make your own judgments, and you can see the shapes of those districts there. And Nancy Pelosi is the Speaker of the House of Representatives. Lots of blue. Lots of blue. There's a couple of red. Um, he's actually the Republican leader in the House of Representatives, so they both come from California right now. Uh, this guy's been uh, rather controversial. You can ask me about that. Um, the, the representative from the 25th district just resigned, so they have to have a special election to fill her seat. Here we're in Southern California. This is Los Angeles. Look at all the blue, all from Los Angeles. There's one little red spot um, southeast of Los Angeles. There's gonna be one more red spot. There it is, Duncan Hunter, he's the last red spot. So there's all 53 of California's representatives. I decided to show you one more state in addition to Oregon, California. This is Ohio. And go ahead and take a look at that and maybe ask yourself some questions about the shapes of those districts. Because this is an example of something we call gerrymandering, which was when you draw the boundaries of a district to pack as many either Democrats or as many Republicans as possible into the district to guarantee uh, electing as many of one party or as many of the other as possible. So you're basically, it's often referred to as voters not choosing their representatives, but representatives choosing their voters because whoever draws these lines and boundaries is enormously powerful 
uh, in terms of deciding how many of the seats in each state are going to go to Democrats and how many are going to go to Republicans, because there is data from the census that shows you how many people are registered with one party as versus how many people are registered with another, including their voting pattern. So this particular map was drawn to elect as many Republicans as possible in a state that should be roughly 52% Republican and 48% Democrat. But if you look at who actually got elected based on these district lines, look at how much red there is versus how much blue. So uh, what I'm trying to say is the process is not always fair. Uh, and I'm using Ohio as an example, but if I used Illinois, it would be exactly the opposite. It was drawn to advantage Democrats. So um, we, we can have a conversation about this. Uh, the other thing I want to show you is our personal uh, representative here in um, Salem. We're going to go to Kurt Schrader's website, hopefully. There we go. This is the representative who represents the Salem area, just in case you want to know. Uh, he's Kurt Schrader. He's a fairly conservative Democrat. Um, he's very big on the national debt right now. As of this recording, we are roughly $23 trillion in debt. That means each and every one of you already owes some money. Uh, if you want to know about Mr. Schrader, he has a lovely biography here. You can read about his life. Uh, he's a veterinarian. He's from the Canby area. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this, but just know that your local representative, our one vote out of 435 is Kurt Schrader. He represents Salem and portions of the Oregon coast and uh, goes all the way up to Clackamas County and um, just south to the, um, the river. And uh, so there he is. And the next part of this video, we're going to actually get into a discussion of the Senate. So that's coming up. So the next thing we want to discuss is the Senate of the United States, which is part of our bicameral legislative branch written under Article 1. The House of Representatives is based on population, and the Senate is based on equality between the states. So this is the part of the first article of the Constitution that is more similar to the New Jersey plan, each state having equal representation. And so if you were to go to the Senate website, which I've done here, you could just literally click on find your senators, scroll to any state in the country and find out who represents that state. I happen to have that memorized, but uh, most people do not. Uh, in the state of Oregon, we have two senators, just like every other state. They are Senator Ron Wyden, who has represented the state since 1996, and Senator Jeff Merkley, who has represented the state since 2009. They are both Democrats, and they have been serving for a lengthy period of time. Uh, senator Wyden served in the House of Representatives before he was a senator, and Senator Merkley was actually the speaker of the Oregon House of Representatives before he was elected senator in 2008, the same year as Barack Obama. Our neighbors to the south are also represented by two Democrats, Senator Dianne Feinstein and Senator Kamala Harris. So the 38 million people of California get exactly two senators, and there they are. Senator Feinstein has been serving since 1992, and Kamala Harris has been serving only since 2017. Our neighbors to the north in Washington are also represented by two women. Senator Patty Murray is a Democrat. She's been serving since 1993. And Maria Cantwell is also a Democrat who has been serving since the year 2001. So our neighbors to the north and the south have two female senators, but we have two male senators and a woman governor. So go figure. And then finally, our neighbors to the east, the uh, further east you go, especially if you're in the middle of the country, the more conservative, the more Republican it tends to be. And so Idaho is represented by two Republican senators, Senator Mike Crapo uh, of Idaho Falls, and he does pronounce it Crapo, and Senator James Risch, uh, who is the former lieutenant governor of that state. Actually, he was governor for a very short period of time. So 
And that kind of shows you how every state, no matter how large or small, gets two senators. I'm not going to do that with all 50 states, but what I am going to show you is this map that shows you the distribution of senators across the country, including Alaska and Hawaii. Um, altogether, there are um, 53 Republicans, and altogether there are 47 Democrats plus two independents, the yellow dots there in Vermont, Bernie Sanders, and Maine, Angus King, uh, who vote with the Democrats. And so um, unlike the House of Representatives, which is controlled by the Democratic Party since the 2018 election, the Senate is still controlled by the Republican Party as of this date, November 4th, 2019. So that is your summary of the U.S. Senate, ladies and gentlemen. You've now had a summary of the House, and you've had a summary of the U.S. Senate. At this point, ladies and gentlemen, it would be appropriate for you to take a few moments to summarize how the Virginia and New Jersey plans were both incorporated into the final draft of the Constitution in Article 1. So you're going to want to describe what the House of Representatives is based on and some details about it versus some details about the Senate um, and which one is more similar to the Virginia plan, which one is more similar to the New Jersey plan. And if you can do that, you will have an amazing summary. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of this particular lesson. It's a lengthy one, but it's a good one. I'll give you time to write your summaries. And this is Mr. Blumendahl signing off until next time on the Waldo Middle School Social Studies YouTube Network.